Todd and Jacob. Uh, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. And uh, as a reminder, we are asking that uh, mics and cameras, oh, mics stay muted and cameras stay off for the duration of today's presentation, unless you are one of our presenters, of course. So uh, with that, we will get into uh, the at least the first few initial slides that we go we need to go through before we get things kicked off um, with questions here. So for those of you that may not know uh, a lot about John Ullman and Associates, we are servicing clients uh, for near for now over 45 years in 44 states nationwide. We have four locations, uh, Corning, Big Flats, and Rhinebeck, New York, along with our newly opened Charlotte, North Carolina branch office, uh, where Todd and Jacob are currently located. We provide comprehensive financial services in areas such as financial planning, investment and portfolio management, tax preparation and tax planning, estate planning, retirement planning, um, and beyond. One disclaimer on this, we are not practicing attorneys. We review these areas as an objective third party with our client's interests at the forefront um, under our comprehensive model. And if you'd like to stay up to date on the latest uh, content, events, uh, things happening with the firm, uh, the best place to find those is uh, on our social channels. We are producing content for each day of the week, including videos, blogs, and podcast content. Uh, you can follow those on the JGUA YouTube channel at JGUA. Uh, we are also on Instagram at JGUA underscore H HQ, excuse me, on Twitter at JGUA underscore HQ. You can also follow us on LinkedIn by search searching John G. Ullman and Associates, Inc., and we are also on Facebook at JGUAHQ, so no underscore there on our Facebook page. And before we get into the questions for today, there is a brief disclaimer that we have to go through, uh, so we'll go through that now. The information discussed in this presentation is current as of the date noted and is for informational purposes only and does not intend to address the financial objective, situation, or specific needs of any individual investor. Any information is for illustrative purposes only and is not intended to serve as investment, tax, or legal advice, since the availability and effectiveness of any strategy is dependent upon your individual facts and circumstances. Results will vary and no suggestion is made about how any specific solution or strategy will perform in reality. And with that, we will get into our pre-submitted questions for today. Um, if you do have a question that you weren't able to submit through the registration process or think of something during today's presentation that you'd like to ask, we do ask that you put that in the chat box. Amelia will be monitoring that throughout the presentation. We have designated time at the end of today's presentation uh, for questions that weren't submitted ahead of time during the registration process. So Amelia will be monitoring that chat and we will uh, make sure that your questions, if there are any at the end, uh, do get answered. So with that, uh, we will jump into our first pre-submitted question of today's webinar. And this one will go to Todd and Jacob, obviously feel free to add your thoughts uh, after Todd has had his chance to go through the question. So Todd, after you sell your house and no longer have deductions to itemize, is there any tax advantage if you make charitable donations? So the uh, simple short answer is no. And I think what they're getting at here is if they sold their home, uh, they probably did not have the home mortgage interest as part of their Schedule A, which is their itemized deductions. So that probably fell below the standard deduction amount so if you are taking the standard deduction, then unfortunately, no, there's no tax advantage uh, to doing any charitable deduction donations. You only get the, uh, the advantage of donating when you, uh, when you itemize and use your Schedule A. I will add to that and say, um, while there's no immediate income tax advantages, uh, if you do have substantial assets over the lifetime gifting threshold, which I think right now is about 13 million per person. So 
24, 25 as a couple. So if you're over that, you can get um, save yourself and your estate some tax dollars if you're above that threshold and donate some highly appreciated assets. Okay, and with that, we'll move into our next question. This one will go to Jacob first. How does a charitable donation affect what I pay in taxes? How much can I give before reaching the point that it is just money out of my pocket and of no tax benefit to me? So kind of how Todd touched on in the first question, it all looks at your itemized deduction. So what your itemized deduction do is essentially lowers the amount of taxable income you'll have on your tax return. Uh, in this case, more is better. The higher your charitable donation, the lower your taxable income will be. With that being said, there are some limits on how much the IRS is going to let you donate. So for cash donations, 60%, that's just because you're not really getting another tax uh, benefit from just donating cash. There's a 50% non-cash contributions to qualified organizations, which does not include any property with capital gains or that has appreciated in value. Now, uh, at 30%, you can look at non-cash contributions and that capital gain property. Uh, the reason this is lower than what the cash might be in the, the non-capital gain property is because by donating the property, you're avoiding paying that capital gains tax and you're also getting a tax deduction for it. So uh, it is a bit lower than the other thresholds. And then there's a 20% limit on that capital gain property to other than uh, qualified organizations. With that being said, there is a five-year carry forward for any donations in excess of those percentages. So keep that in mind. But if you do happen to die before you've used all of your carry forward, it is gone. So you, you've lost any benefit there. Todd, anything to add? Oh, that was great. All right. We will go ahead and move into our next question here. And this one will go back to Todd. Uh, what amount of donations is needed to file itemized contributions as a single person with no dependents? So the, uh, the single standard deduction for this year is 13850 So... Um, a lot of people think that that's how much my charitable contribution has to be. Uh, the charitable contribution is just one of about four pieces of the itemized deduction on Schedule A. So when you add up your medical expenses, the second category is what we call the, the salt limit, the sales and um, the sales taxes that have a, uh, a threshold of $10,000. Then you can add in your home mortgage interest and then also your charitable contributions. So if all of those buckets add up to something over than 13,850 as a single tax, uh, single tax person, uh, then you would use your itemized deductions. If all those total less than 13,850 as a single filer, then you would take the standard deduction. So again, it's not the 13,850 that's the uh, limit for um, donations that includes all of your uh, itemized deductions, including the charity. So when you add all those up and and they're over the thirteen eight fifty, then you would you would itemize. Anything to add, Jacob? Nope. Nope. You think you covered it all? Okay. This next question, we will start with Jacob. Uh, I work at a I work at two nonprofits and have an understanding of year end giving from that angle. I am less clear as a giver what I should be doing to balance year end goals and donations throughout the year. So this is kind of gets a little specific to your situation and what your year end goals are and what your donations you are making yearly. So uh, we figured this would be a good time to kind of talk about uh, another strategy, which is bunching your charitable gifts. So if you intend to make uh, a $10,000 donation this year to your charity, and then you just intend on making the same $10,000 to the charity next year, you can actually bunch those donations. So in, in other words, you take the 20,000 this year, give it to your charity, and that way you're maximizing that itemized deduction that Todd just went into some depth about. 
and hopefully you're over the threshold for your standard deduction based upon your filing status. Anything to add, Todd? No, I think that covers it again. The, you know, the, this is really, if you have the resources to do that, um, you know, the, the $10,000 over, you know, even like Jake said, over three years, if you want to put 30 into one, even as married filing joint uh, filers, you would be over the, uh, uh, the limit and you would be able to take advantage of your itemized deductions. So again, it's a cash flow issue. If you're able to bunch and bundle your contributions in one year, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that. In this one, we will start with Todd. Uh, are there certain types of assets that are more advantageous for charitable donations? Yeah, that's a that's a neat question. So we've we've heard the term appreciated long term securities. Those are just uh, stocks in your brokerage account that have done really well. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to donate those because what what usually happens is if you were to sell those um, stocks, you would pay the the capital gain on those. Um, at about 15 to 20 percent, and then you would probably donate less to the charity. So if you just donate the appreciated stocks or securities, they go right to the charity. The charity is a tax exempt organization. They don't have to pay the capital gains tax. So they sell uh, your holding of, of that stock and they get the full benefit. So it's pretty much a real win win situation. Um, the other opportunity, and again, I don't know if this is exactly what the person was asking, but uh, QCDs, Qualified Charitable Distributions, are a great, uh, a great uh, vehicle to use if you're over 70 and a half. And this type of asset would be an asset in your, in your IRA. You have to take a, a minimum amount out, uh, but you can use it as a, as a gift to charity. So as long as it goes right from your IRA to the charity. It doesn't hit your tax return, skips right over your tax return. So you don't pay the taxes on that. And again, the charity gets the full benefit of that qualified charitable distribution. So a couple really neat opportunities with, uh, with that question. Any additions to make, Jacob? Nope, that all sounds good. Okay. And now we'll go to Jacob for our next question here. Uh, what are the pros and cons of different charitable giving vehicles, such as donor advised funds, charitable remainder trusts, or charitable gift annuities? So I'll start by talking a little bit about donor advised funds. Uh, those are private funds kind of held by a third party where you make the make your charitable donations. With this strategy, you kind of maintain some control over where the, those uh, donations are sent. With that being, you also get some tax deductions, which are pretty beneficial of that strategy. One very important consideration with this and the other two charitable remainder trusts and charitable gift annuities is that they are all irrevocable. So once that money is in any of those funds or trusts, you can't take it out. You can't uh, can't re uh, redo that charitable donation. So definitely remember that. So charitable remainder trusts. This is a uh, kind of like a two-step process so during your life or the specified period for the trust uh, a beneficiary that you've chosen it does not have to be charitable gets a income stream uh, once the time frames up or you have passed the remainder then goes to the trust again it's irrevocable it could be a specified uh, time it could be at your death you get some pretty uh, substantial tax benefits with that especially at death um, avoiding any capital gains tax on the assets or property within the funds. And this is a good strategy if the property is already appreciated. So there's already a, a high amount of capital gains on that that you're gonna avoid paying. And then the last strategy, the charitable gift annuities. This you, uh, a little kind of similar, you make a, a one-time big donation to a, a charity and then you receive income for life. Uh, it, based on your contribution and then at death, the charity keeps whatever's left over. It is a limited tax deduction just due to the nature of the, the strategy, but it is a pretty interesting um, strategy all as well. And one important consideration with all these is that there is the trade-off between 
cost of setting these up and what amount you're going to save from these charitable donations. A lot of these can be pretty pricey to get set up for, uh, for you, especially the trusts and getting attorneys involved. So make sure you take that into consideration if you have any thoughts about any of these strategies. Any additions to make, Todd? Uh, just that I'm glad Jake got that question. Uh, <laughs> there is a, there is an expense to set these all up, like Jake said. So probably these are really based for larger contributions, for sure. Um, the other one that wasn't mentioned in the question is a charitable lead trust. Uh, exactly the opposite of the charitable remainder trust that Jake talked about. So a charitable lead trust means that the charity would actually get the stream of annuity payments uh, during the life and then the beneficiary would uh, uh, get the remainder after the term is up. So exactly the opposite of the charitable remainder trust is the charitable lead trust. But uh, as Jake said, these are irrevocable and they do require a legal agreement. So there is some cost to setting any of these vehicles up. All right, and with that, we will go to our next question and we'll lead off with Todd on this one. What are the important deadlines for making charitable contributions before the end of the year? So really, there isn't any as long as it's done before 1231. Now, the caveat with that is, and we run into it with our folks at Schwab and Morgan Stanley, because there's always such a huge holiday rush and everyone's trying to get all this done uh, in late December, a lot of the brokers have their own deadlines for making some of these contributions. Some are as early as the first week in, in December or even the second week in December. So we need to be very aware of that, especially when we're dealing with our clients. We don't want to miss that deadline. Uh, checks again with, with the mail and the unpredictability of the mail. We're always hesitant about checks going in the mail. Uh, will they get to the charity before year end or not? So a lot of times, especially for local uh, charities, we may have, you know, the check written out to the charity. We may have the check go to our client and have them, you know, walk it down uh, to be sure 100% that it gets there before year end. Plus, you get to say hi and, and present the check. So no real deadlines from a tax planning standpoint other than the end of the year, but definitely some internal uh, deadlines that you need to be aware of when making contributions in December. Okay, and we'll move to our next question with uh, Jacob leading us off. Uh, what strategies exist if I want to leave a lasting impact through charitable giving? This question kind of relates to the, the last question I had with all of the uh, donor advised funds, the charitable remainder trust, the charitable lead trust. Um, those are great ways to leave a lasting impact and kind of leave somewhat of a legacy, whether it be for your beneficiaries or a charity of your choice. Um, and then with each of those strategies, there are different subcategories. So with the charitable remainder trust, there's Kratz and Kratz which is a charitable remainder annuity trust and a charitable remainder unit trust. This just changes how much, what amount is coming out each year, whether it's a fixed amount or a fixed percentage. Uh, the same thing can be said with charitable lead trust with clats and cluts. It's a little bit of an alphabet soup. So if you're thinking about uh, looking at any of these strategies in more depth, be sure to get some help because it can get pretty complex pretty quick with these. All right, and moving to our next question with Todd taking this one. Uh, are there specific considerations for donating during economically uncertain times? Good question, because we're sure in economically uncertain times right now, uh, even over the last uh, couple of years, the, the volatility in the economy and for sure in the stock market has just been off the charts. Really, there's no tax implications at all. Um, obviously, when dealing with appreciated securities, the stats show that a lot more people give when the markets are up, when they've got more winners in their brokerage accounts than they have losers. Um, but uh, to, to expand on that, if you do have some losers, and 
over the last two years, like I said, with the volatility, most anyone uh, that has a significant number of stocks has both winners and losers. Definitely makes sense to either sell the losers, maybe at year end, we call that uh, tax loss harvesting, or hold on to them. Uh, hopefully they appreciate, or you can use them the following year, year after, to offset some of the gains. So uh, some strategies there for sure, but uh, uncertain times, we are definitely in them. I think trying to time the market is, uh, is absolutely the wrong strategy. That is 100% impossible. A perfect example was just the last couple months. October was an awful month in the stock market. And then we saw uh, November come and uh, it, all the gains were, were back. So extreme volatility, never try to time the market, but uh, uncertain times we are in for sure. Anything to add there, Jacob? Nope, that all sounded great. All right, and with that, Jake, we will go into our last question for you. Uh, and then after this, so if you start, if you do have questions that you've thought of during um, today's session, now would be a good time to start to put those into the chat because um, our next slide will be open Q&A. So again, if you've thought of some questions or have questions that you weren't able to pre-submit in our registration process, you can go ahead and put those in now. Um, but with that, we'll jump into the last que pre-submitted question for today's session. Uh, are there any advantages to making charitable gifts earlier in the year versus closer to the end of the year? So again, kind of the similar question Todd had, but no, not uh, any advantages to you. Uh, I know that some charities have certain goals and deadlines that they like to hit throughout the year with different projects and whatnot. So it could be beneficial to the charity to have it sooner than later. Uh, other than the year end and what Todd was talking about with everyone kind of waiting until the last few weeks to get all this stuff done. So the brokers get pretty overwhelmed. So make sure you're not waiting to last minute. I know uh, a lot of people also take vacation or just work a lot slower when the holidays are around. So make sure to get those in earlier than later. Todd, anything to add? Yeah, that's great. Just the, the stats show that uh, over 50% of the charitable donations are done in October, November, and December. So uh, like Jake touched on, it's probably good for the charities to get some of those in advance. So don't always wait till the holiday advertisements show up on the TV. It's nice to do it uh, before because the, uh, the charities need, uh, need the help throughout the year. But stats show that everyone waits till October, November, and December.